welcome to you all. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this uh, second uh, webinar in our session looking at the LVRRS implementation actions. I'm Ray Mackay. I'm the chair of the MLRA board and will be the host for this evening. Um, to get things started, I'd first of all like to um, acknowledge that we are hosting this webinar from the traditional lands of the Briakalong people of the Gurnai Kurnai Nation and pay respects to their elders past and present. We also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are all located and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be online with us today. Welcome. Um, before we begin, um, I'd just like to take you through some housekeeping. Um, as a participant, uh, you are not able to turn on your camera or your microphone. This helps to limit interruptions to our presenters and improves the audio and video quality for all attending. Uh, most importantly, please make sure that you add your questions using the Q&A function within Microsoft Teams. To access this function, click on the speech icon with the question mark on the top right hand corner and the Q&A bar should open to you on the right of your screen. Uh, you can like the questions by clicking the thumb icon and as last week, um, those questions that wrote me received the most uh, likes are going to be those questions that we will try and answer this evening. If there are a lot of questions, then we will have to uh, follow up with written answers to the questions that we can't get to uh, uh, through 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 the night. So there have been uh, a few questions submitted by Slido, uh, which is great, uh, and uh, we'll probably cover those off uh, as the first um, uh, questions that will be asked uh, uh, once we get to those and we're going to ask all the questions after we've had both uh, of uh, today's presentations. Uh, it's appropriate to say that technology may not work perfectly for everyone and uh, if you do experience problems just let us know in the Q&A box and uh, our team uh, working behind the scenes will endeavour to, to help. Um, obviously, to ensure that nobody misses out, uh, we are recording the event and will publish the recording on our website. Uh, so uh, if by any reason you do drop out, uh, then uh, we uh, uh, apologize for that, but, uh, but you will be able to catch up. And of course, you can contact us at the uh, Mineland Rehabilitation Authority at any time uh, to have a further conversation if you so wish. Uh, we're really delighted uh, by the number of people who registered to attend the event. There were over 170 uh, uh, registrations, so that's fantastic. And I hope uh, the majority of the people who registered are able to be with us uh, 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 this evening. As you'll know, the uh, Latrobe Valley Regional Rehabilitation uh, Strategy is concerned with safe, stable and sustainable uh, rehabilitation of the Latrobe Brown Coal Mines. And last week we heard about the availability um, of water in the Latrobe River system and the issues around climate and climate uh, uh, adjustments that are taking place into the future that are likely to lead to uh, lower available water sources. This week uh, we're covering off two uh, what I regard as extremely important actions. Uh, the first, uh, which will be presented by Anna May, uh, we'll be uh, looking at uh, access to alternative water sources other than the Latrobe River system and uh, 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 the local uh, water source systems. Um, and the other one will be looking at uh, how we might um, continue rehabilitation if we need to uh, in the absence of water um, or uh, how we actually might stop uh, if we find that water-based rehabilitation uh, cannot continue for any reason uh, because uh, uh, we, we actually do not have the water supplies that we expected or anticipated. Um, so we're going to move straight on with the uh, uh, presentations. 
uh, we're uh, going to uh, first of all listen to Anna May, who is the Director of Water Resources Assessment and Planning at the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Uh, she is going to uh, uh, present on the feasibility of alternative water for mine rehabilitation. So thank you, Anna, over to you. Thank you, Ray. Thanks, Ray, and good evening, everyone. It's nothing like um, throwing a spanner in the works with internet troubles, so hopefully that doesn't happen for me. Um, firstly, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands in which I'm located, as well as the Gunai Kurnai people who are the traditional owners of the Latrobe Valley, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. My name is Anna May, and I'm the Director of Water Resource Assessment and Planning in at Delp, as Ray mentioned. And I've worked at Delp over the last four years. Prior to that, I've spent 15 years in the water industry, as well as in local government and different consultancies. I really do feel privileged to be able to be working across the different sectors to chip away at this really gnarly problem and help navigate a pathway to find a good solution for everyone. Some of you may remember me from last week. Um, I presented on um, water sharing in the Latrobe River alongside my colleague, Jeff Steenden, who spoke about the latest research and guidance from Victoria's Water and Climate Initiative. Tonight, we'll be building upon these discussions to further um, to provide further information on alternative water and non-water-based work streams that make up the implementation of the Latrobe Valley Regional Rehabilitation Strategy, or the LVRS, as I might call it later on in the presentation. It is a bit of a mouthful. I hope tonight helps complete that picture for you of the work that's underway and gives you an appreciation of the magnitude and complexity of mine rehabilitation in the Latrobe Valley. I think it is worth reiterating that within DELP we are treating this work as a priority and we are coordinating across government to get the best possible outcome. We're mindful of its significance to the residents of Latrobe Valley and we're acutely aware of the interest in alternative water sources, which was made apparent through the Q&A session last week. I think I've already answered some questions on alt water um, last week already. Um, the Minister for Resources words really resonated with me when she said as part of the release of the strategy last year that rehabilitation must consider a drying climate and alternate water rather than relying on water from the Latrobe River system. It may be required protecting existing water entitlements and the rights of existing users, including farmers, communities and the environment. So exploring these alternate water options um, we are we are exploring these alternate water options. We're committed to doing a thorough job and we're also committed to approaching it with as much openness as transparency as possible. So as many of you are aware, um, there's six implementation of the LVRS actions and four of them are really um, focused on the improved information base to inform rehabilitation options. They're the ones highlighted here and the focus of these different MLRA webinars. Um, so we as DELP is, are responsible for leading three of those six implementation actions and they're the ones highlighted blue on the slide and will provide guidance, these will provide guidance on the processes and pathways to potentially access water for mine rehab. These include accessing water from the Latrobe River system, which we know from last week's presentation has significant challenges due to the trends we are seeing in that drying climate and the prospect that this will continue. And we know there are existing uses and values that must be protected. DELP is also assessing pathways to potentially access larger volumes of climate independent water from outside of the Latrobe River. And that's going to be the focus of my presentation today, which is to investigate the feasibility of alternate water sources for mine rehabilitation. Anthony Feigl from DJPR will also talk to the work they are leading in assessing non-water based rehabilitation options. So these discrete work packages, so when combined, are aimed to provide clear guidance and an improved information base to respond to community feedback and provide trans better transparency across all rehabilitation options, including those non-water based options which didn't, which didn't form a part of the initial LVRS. It's to identify pathways for different rehabilitation approaches and also support the mine licensees in the development of their rehabilitation plans. 
The information and guidance developed as part of the discrete work packages and streams will need to be considered together and be optimised by mine licensees and government in consultation with key stakeholders in the community to determine the most appropriate approach for rehabilitation of each of the Latrobe Valley mines. Before I jump into the implementation action itself, I did want to touch on what we heard from stakeholders in the community through the LVRS process. It was clear from mine licensees that a water-based mine rehabilitation approach remained their preferred approach. And it was the clear sentiment that mine rehabilitation should not come at the expense or the cost of others. Stakeholders were concerned about availability of water and were keen to ensure that it didn't come at um, as an offset for other productive uses of water and the environment. Some stakeholders raised the Gibson Lakes Ramsar sites and wanted to ensure pit lakes are not created at the expense of Gippsland Lakes. And the community was calling for clarity and transparency of process and information, including the full consideration of rehabilitation options. And that's what we're trying to do here. We also heard there is a need for strong partnership and a desire for lasting positive legacy for these mine sites. So through the implementation of the strategy, we're really conscious of what we've heard and, can try and, and we're trying to continually build these elements into the delivery of the work streams as much as possible. We've also engaged with different stakeholders in the community through the scoping of the individual discrete actions. And I'll reflect on this and what we've heard and how it's shaped our work streams shortly. So why alternative water? And I won't dwell on this because this was a bit of a focus of last week. But just briefly, this is because the strategy found there's been an observed decline in water availability in the Latrobe system, reducing from a long-term average of around 800 gigalitres per year to around 600 gigalitres per year. So that's a decline of around 25%. Water availability is tracking along the drier climate projection with future declines quite plausible. Under a dry climate scenario, it's estimated that water availability could decline to around 470 gigalitres a year by 2050. And to put that in context, this is around the time of the planned closure of the Loyang mine. So we're talking when we're talking mine rehabilitation, we're looking talking really long time frames. To completely fill the three Latrobe Valley mine voids would require an, would require an enormous amount of water around 2,800 gigalitres of water, and that's equivalent um, to around five Sydney harbours, with an ongoing volume around 15 gigalitres per year to make up for evaporation. Last week we spoke about this at length um, and around the future uncertainty of water availability. The LVRS itself made it clear that mine rehabilitation should plan for a drier climate and that water for mine rehabilitation should not impact traditional owner or environmental values or the rights of existing water users. So this really means it's prudent that a climate resilient water supply is further assessed alongside those non-water based rehabilitation options. So we've observed declines in water availability over the last 20 years or so, and we can't categorically say that these reductions will continue, but the latest climate science projections are telling us that it's possible. If this was to occur, it would substantially impact the time it would take to fill the mines if they were able to be filled at all. We also know from the geotechnical work that the mines were to, be, if the mines were to be filled, filled, a faster fill is better, particularly through those coal seams where they're more susceptible to erosion and stability issues. I probably don't need to say this to those on the line, but it's really important to ensure safe and stable conditions can be achieved to provide certain entity to us all that the mines can be um, well rehabilitated. This means the mine voids in the first instance should be designed in a way to minimise the need for intervention, such as bringing in significant volumes of water. And I know Anthony will talk to the work DJR, DJPR are completing um, to better understand how safety and stability can be managed with less or no water. This may not dismiss um, the need for some or potentially a lot of water to be needed for mine rehabilitation, which means, again, it's really prudent to consider the viability of the sources of water, which are not dependent on climate or rainfall. 
Alternative water sources in the context of mine rehabilitation means water from sources which are able to deliver climate independent water at significant scales. This water must be suitable for its intended end use, which, mean, which means it may need some or considerable treatment to be compliant with Victoria's strict regulatory standards. The alternative water that we are interested in should make a material difference to speed up rehabilitation on a regional scale for more than one of the mines. The examples of alternate water illustrated here are stormwater, recycled water and seawater. Importantly, these are not new or unfamiliar sources of water and they do currently play an important part in Victoria's water supply portfolio. If viable, we would simply be building on their use and capitalising on the knowledge processes and frameworks already established. For example, almost 500 gigalitres of recycled water is treated every year across Victoria. Around 100 gigalitres of this is put to productive purposes, and I'll talk to some of them now. You may be aware to the Melbourne's West, Class A recycled water, which is the highest quality water, from Western Treatment Plant is delivered to vegetable growers in the Werribee Irrigation District. There are proven and accepted regulatory rules which underpin the supply of recycled water, and it's now considered by most to be a product that can be relied upon to help growers withstand dry conditions, but also boost productivity in other years. Just last year, more than 20 gigalitres were supplied by Melbourne Water and delivered by Southern Rural Water to the growers in the district. But recycled water it hasn't just been limited to irrigation use. Another example of its use is, its, is where it's been supplied to residents, businesses, parks and community facilities in the growth areas of Melbourne and the Geelong region. In these areas, recycled water is supplied to residential properties via a dedicated purple pipe network. And yes, it is actually a purple pipe for toilet flushing, garden watering, and in some cases, clothes washing, amongst other uses. Almost three gigalitres of recycled water was delivered to customers in Geelong last year. And greater use of alternate water sources gives us a better chance for keeping our communities green, livable and resilient, ensuring we are extracting as much value as possible from every drop. The state government policy makes it clear through its integrated water management framework that funding for these types of schemes should be provided by organisations which benefit from them, whether it be local government, a water corporation or a private enterprise. Moving on to desalinated water, and some of you may be aware of the desalination plant in Wampaggy. Just last year, um, Melbourne um, was connected that supply was connected to regional areas and 120 billion litres of desalinated water was supplied. Given the growth in Melbourne and surrounding areas, it's expected that the desalination plant will be delivering at its full capacity of 150 billion litres in the not too distant future. Continued growth in the Melbourne and regional areas means it will remain a critical feature of the Victorian water grid for years to come, underpinning the security and reliability of not only Melbourne water supply, but also supporting urban water security in the interconnected regional towns. Now to the implementation action. I mentioned earlier that when we were scoping this action, we did re-engage with many of the stakeholders and community groups. I'll quickly summarise what we heard. We heard that we need to coordinate and collaborate with stakeholders and be mindful of broader regional programs. So we are talking to people like Southern Rural Water who are responsible for irrigation in the region, as well as people like La Trobe City Council and other groups. We learned that it's important to consider a broad range of resilient, climate resilient alternative water options. And that's why we're starting with really looking at that long list of options um, and we're continuing to whittle that down with stakeholders. I'll talk more about this process shortly. And finally, it was made clear to us that water quality is a key consideration when assessing alternative water options. For that reason, we have commenced a process for assessing water quality risks to a range of end users. 
So to deliver this action, we've broken it down into four key tasks. First, we need to understand the underpinning assumptions that will be used to test if an alternate water source could, could potentially be feasible. For example, understanding the intended use of the water and the mine void, what volumes have been considered and what might acceptable fill rates be. To draw these assumptions out, the Latrobe Valley Mine licensees and electricity generators are actively collaborating with government and the broader water sector, such as Melbourne Water and Gippsland Water. This collaboration has been really important because we need all stakeholders to own and support any potential solution if it has any chance of progressing further. This process also allowed us to discuss the characteristics of each mines, their depths, proximity to other features such as water bodies, roads and townships that we really need to be mindful of. It did become clear that each mine is very different, perhaps not leading to a one size fits all approach, so they may need to be nuanced. It also became clear that some mines are still more in the exploratory phase for rehabilitation than others, naturally driven by closure timeframes. For example, Hazelwood is much further down the path um, of their rehabilitation planning work than mines like Loyang. Secondly, we will work to develop a shorter list of options to be further explored and identifying those sources that could form part of a regional solution for mine rehabilitation, drilling down into the water source quality and those different requirements. And finally, we will assess and compare how the options impact both in a positive and potentially a negative sense, the different stakeholders and the community. The plan is to draw this work together into an options comparison, which will help to ensure the community is best placed to engage meaningfully on the feasibility of the alternate water options. So really making it really clear what the pros and cons of different options might be. I should emphasize here that the LVRRS is just one process um, that will guide mine rehabilitation. Mine licensees themselves are responsible for developing individual rehabilitation plans and seeking the necessary approvals. So from this perspective, I would encourage you all to also engage with mine operators on their rehabilitation planning processes. The guidance and information prepared as part of this action and the broader LVRS will help to inform these individual mine rehabilitation plans and support a regional solution. And the process to narrow down options and assess their feasibility will work towards ensuring we've got clear, a clear understanding of how each option could support mine rehabilitation at a regional scale to provide certainty and ultimately a positive outcome for the community. This slide illustrates the process that I just spoke to. So we're starting with that long list of options. Some predictable, such as recycled water from East Melbourne's Eastern Treatment Plant or from Gippsland Water, and others not so predictable or conventional. So that's the long list. Some examples of the blue sky thinking that has been done to date includes the capture, reuse and sharing of water that is used on site as part of the existing mine operations, or looking at the condensation and use of steam coming from the cooling towers, which I think was also mentioned in the comment last um, week in the webinar. So finally, these options will be whittled down to hone in on the ones that could provide a level of certainty for mine rehabilitation to achieve safe, stable and sustainable landforms. The narrowed down options will also meet requirements such as being climate resilient, able to provide benefits across multiple mines and able to provide the volumes of an acceptable water quality within the timeframes needed for rehabilitation. So these options will be considered for further assessment, including concept design and estimation of costs. And we do know now that some of these options that will be considered are likely to have significant capital costs in the order of billions of dollars. And a water-based mine rehabilitation is unlikely to be a cheap solution. The ongoing operating costs are also expected to be significant from these alternative water supplies. Through this process, we're unlikely to categorically rule anything in or out. So we'll still keep that long list of option, options. So nor is it a commitment to proceed with any one of the shortlisted options. 
The process is purely an assessment of feasibility to understand which options are more likely to help on a regional, regional scale for mine rehab. So this is a data gathering exercise and is fundamentally designed to improve our information base and your information base. So any future decisions are robust um, and informed by good evidence. So on to next steps. So over the next little while, we'll be working through the technical aspects to narrow down the options and complete detailed, um, sorry, concept level designs. We will be building on this work through two additional and discrete pieces of analysis. The first one mentioned here is really making sure we've got a really good understanding of the water quality requirements of the alternate water supply to make sure that any option is fit for purpose and acceptable to the community and has no negative impacts to the environment. The second part will take a broader perspective to assessing the feasibility of different alternative water options to better understand the possible flow on impacts, again, both positive and negative to different stakeholder groups and the community. So for example, asking the question, as to how might an alternate water supply support agricultural expansion or water security for the broader Gippsland region. So not just focused on the mine rehab side of things, although that is the primary focus. So there's plenty of water to go under the bridge before this work is finished, but we are looking for this work to inform the feasibility of different alternate water supplies for mine rehab. So this feasibility assessment will need to be considered in light of other work streams of the LBRS, including the non-water based rehab options, which will be discussed by Anthony later tonight, and the water availability from the Latrobe River system and the local aquifers. So together, these work streams will provide guidance and will be an improved information base for mine licensees and government in consultation with key stakeholders in the community to determine the most appropriate pro approach for rehabilitation of each of the Latrobe Valley mines. Personally, I don't expect any of the individual work streams will achieve a safe, stable and sustainable rehabilitated mine in its own right, or an optimised solution, I should say. But it's important to make sure that the individual pathways that, the, that we're working on now are well understood through the current process. So that when it comes to developing rehabilitation plans, both water and non-water based techniques will need to be optimised to deliver solutions that can provide certainty to mine licensees, the community and the government that safe, stable and sustainable landforms can be achieved over the long term. We are conscious that we need to deliver these work packages in the short term and we are not underestimating the complexity and volume of work required to do this. I can say that over the last few months, I've definitely seen a fair bit of enthusiasm between the different stakeholders involved. And through this collaborative effort, I believe we're up to the challenge. So finally, I'd like to thank you for your time, um, your interest in this topic, and thanks to MLRA again for hosting this webinar. And I'll hand back to Ray to introduce the next topic. Um. That was excellent. Um, it gives you uh, uh, everybody who's listening in a very clear perspective on just how big a topic uh, uh, that the alternative water options study is. And, and I think uh, uh, I'm sure that it's going to generate a number of questions. So uh, to uh, encourage you again, could uh, anybody who has a question, uh, could they pop on to the Q&A uh, forum and, and, and type their question in. But I'd also welcome anybody who hasn't actually got a question but would like to just see what sort of questions are being asked to go on and uh, like those questions if you would like to hear them uh, be asked this evening. So uh, it's, it's very important that we actually uh, try and ask those questions that uh, are uh, most uh, uh, important. Um, the uh, Next speaker is Anthony Feigl, uh, and Anthony Feigl is the uh, current acting director of Coal Res Resources Victoria. Um, he's also uh, uh, been uh, uh, the project manager for the LVRS for uh, uh, the last few years uh, and uh, uh, has a, a very strong uh, understanding of the whole of the program of the LVRS. But today he's actually going to talk to you on uh, 
uh, the identification of non-water rehabilitation options and contingency options to manage land stability and fire risks. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Anthony. Well, thank you, Ray, and thank you, attendees, for, for your time to attend today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to the MRA for hosting this event, and thanks also to both Ray and Anna for their acknowledgements uh, to country, which I don't need to do now, so thanks for that. Uh, and I won't introduce myself either, as Ray has just, has just done that. As Ray said, the purpose of this presentation is to provide an update on LVRS Implementation Action 5, Alternative and Contingency Rehabilitation Options. I'll mostly be talking about alternative or non-water rehabilitation options today, but we're also looking at contingency options in a very similar way. This work's being delivered in consultation with the mine licensees, the Mine Land Rehabilitation Authority and the Latrobe Valley Mine Rehabilitation Advisory Committee, which is made up of community and stakeholder representatives. So why explore alternative rehabilitation options or non-water options? Well, during the preparation of the strategy, as Anna mentioned, it became clear that water availability in the Latrobe River system has reduced and may continue to, de to decline. So to meet the aims of achieving safe, stable and sustainable rehabilitated landforms, rehabilitation activities and final landforms must be climate resilient. A range of stakeholders requested that the feasibility of non-water rehabilitation options be further explored. And this work will help inform the preparation of declared mine rehabilitation plans by the mine licensees, the state's assessment of such plans, and provide you community with an improved information base. Two basic but really significant requirements for a rehabilitated the Trobe Valley coal mine to be safe and stable, uh, that fire risk must be no greater than the surrounding environment, and the walls and floor of the mine should not collapse, of course. Two really basic requirements, but actually really quite significant in terms of the work required to ensure that, that um, that's in place. When the mines are operating, the potential for coal to catch fire is managed by covering worked out areas of the mine in soil and through sprinkler systems delivering water to operational parts of the mine. When the mine is no longer in operation, however, minimising the potential of a coal fire would require covering the soil, uh, sorry, covering the coal with soil or water or maintaining forever a fire management system. In terms of assessing the potential stability of mine walls under different operational and rehabilitation designs, there's three main factors. If the stabilising forces are greater than the destabilising forces, the wall is considered stable. A factor of safety is calculated by dividing the stabilising forces by the destabilising forces. So for example, a factor of safety of two to one would mean that the stabilising forces are twice that of the destabilising forces. The forces for and against stability are calculated using engineering equations that include things like the strength of the coal and other geological layers, the frictional resistance to coal layers sliding over the top of the underlying clay layers, groundwater pressure within the coal and clay layers, which can reduce the friction between layers. Because the geology is highly variable and complex, there is always some uncertainty in these calculations, which can mean the ground might behave differently than was expected. In general, therefore, the higher the factor of safety, the less likely that local complexities in the geology may cause the wall of the mine to collapse. The technical approach taken for this implementation includes creating cross sections through the planned final walls of each mine, using plans provided by the mine operators and the state's regional geological model. For each geological layer, 
We're assigning material strength properties from previous testing undertaken by the State Electricity Commission and the mine operators. For each cross section, we're now calculating the stability of the wall under different rehabilitation concepts. We're currently working with the mine operators and the Mine Land Rehabilitation Authority to assess the extent to which the stability of the walls of the mines can be managed through the rehabilitation process, for example, by changing the slope of the wall of the mine, placing material at the base of slopes to buttress them, reducing the inflow of surface water into coal joints and draining, draining water from the coal to reduce the hydraulic push on the coal blocks, and improving the strength between layers by placing material on or above the slope known as surcharging and reducing groundwater pressures within the layers. These are the key controls that are, that are available for uh, mine wall stability. For non-water rehabilitation options, this study will help us collectively understand things like can slope buttressing and sur surcharging with groundwater management provide a stable mine wall in the long term? If so, how much material has to be moved? What type is it? Where would it come from? When material is moved, is there enough of the right type of material to make slopes stable and cover all the coal? What are the ongoing maintenance requirements to keep the mine safe, stable and sustainable? And what are the ongoing risks post-closure? For non-water rehabilitation options, ongoing groundwater extraction would likely be required to manage floor heave at two or three of the mines. Our working assumption is that extracted groundwater would be treated and discharged to waterways or could be used for other uses like irrigation. And long-term land subsidence and associated impacts would of course need to be assessed prior to committing to that option. The study follows a staged assessment process as set out here. Through this process to date, we've been consulting with, as I mentioned before, the, the mine operators who have also provided a lot of data, advice and participated in a number of risk workshops. The Mine Land Rehabilitation Authority and the Latrobe Valley Mine Rehabilitation Advisory Committee, in particular to develop the approach to this study. This work, along with the study which Anna has just summarised, will help inform the preparation of declared mine rehabilitation plans by mine licensees, as I mentioned before, uh, the state's assessment of those plans and, and provide you community with, with an improved information base so that uh, you can provide uh, further inputs to, to this work and you are able to fully consider the plans that are um, put forward by licensees. So thank you again for your time today. Thank you very much for that, uh, Anthony. Um, again, there is a significant body of work that needs to be done. Uh, and again, just to re remind uh, everybody, if you have any questions in relation to the work that Anthony has presented, uh, we'd be delighted if you wanted to ask those questions and I'll be able to pass them on to uh, uh, to Anthony as we go through. Now, um, right at the start of this uh, session, I had hoped that I was going to be able to uh, introduce you to uh, David Salmon, our new Chief Executive Officer. Uh, and I'm actually going to take the liberty of uh, just allowing him two or three minutes just to introduce himself now while uh, uh, our uh, uh, panel of uh, Anna and Anthony uh, get ready to answer what turns out to be a significant number of questions. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to you, David, just to give a very brief introduction to yourself. It is a privilege for me to join the MLRA and to be involved in this exciting and novel initiative and to be part of the existing and experienced and very capable team. I commenced work last month working remotely from Queensland and only for the interim. This week I'm in the valley meeting with stakeholders and mine operators. 
My career has spanned nearly 37 years in mining environmental, mine water management and closure and rehabilitation management. I studied geology in, in the UK, worked with the Anglo-American Corporation in South Africa for 27 years and then moved to Australia in 2008 to take up various consulting roles before joining the MLRA. <clears throat> I would like to acknowledge the hard work the team has put into doing this webinar and the one last week and thank the presenters Anthony and Anna May for their excellent presentations. I'd also like to thank all attendees and encourage you to do some more questions if you have them. And finally, many thanks to Ray McKay for hosting this webinar. And now back to Ray. Anyway, David is going to be leading the work of the authority as we progress forward, uh, and that's fantastic. Um, doesn't mean that I'm going to disappear. I am actually going to be uh, remaining as chair of the board and uh, will be working closely with David and the team uh, to assist uh, uh, in delivering the MLRA's uh, program of work. So that'll, that'll be uh, uh, a lot of hard work uh, that uh, will be undertaken over the next few years. Uh, we look forward to seeing how it, how, how the, the authority develops. Anyway, I'm going to get back now on to this evening. Um, and before I get on to the Q&A questions, I, there were a couple of the questions that were introduced into Slido um, earlier today. Uh, and I just want to ask uh, those questions uh, 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 of Anna and, uh, 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 and Anthony now. Um, the first question is uh, for you, Anthony. Um, basically because you're uh, effectively acting as the project manager for uh, for the overarching activities of the strategy. Um, once uh, completed, uh, will all the information relating to uh, the implementation action that you're looking at, which is the options and alternative uh, uh, contingency options be made publicly available? And will that be a general practice for all of the implementation actions. Well, thank you, Ray, for uh, the question or for passing on the question. Thank you, whoever submitted the question. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, the slightly longer answer is in June this year, we'll be coming out with some summary information on these studies. Uh, following that, there will be a process over the course of the two years um, between June this year and June 2023 to update the strategy, which has to be updated every three years under the Act. Uh, and that period, there will be further studies that will no doubt be needed. The, the findings that will be published in uh, June this year will no doubt be a, um, a snapshot of point in time knowledge. It will be far from um, the complete knowledge base that will ultimately be needed to rehabilitate all three mines. Yes, we will be releasing information as we go. That's Thank lovely. You. Thanks very much, Anthony. Um, moving quickly on then to the second question is actually comes in two parts and I'm going to hand uh, a, a, a bit to Anthony, uh, the first part. Uh, which is how are you incorporating and utilising traditional Gunai Kurnai vegetation in the rehabilitation of the sites? Now, before I hand to Anthony, uh, it, it's probably appropriate to say that there has been quite a bit of what's called progressive rehabilitation that's been done on these sites over the years, and some of that work has been done uh, taking full account of uh, uh, using traditional knowledge, traditional plants, etc. So uh, there, there is an ongoing uh, progressive development uh, in that space. So Anthony, do you have anything you want to say? Uh, yeah, just to add to that, it was a great question. I'll add to that that the, the mine licensees have provided all strong commitments to work closely with GLOAC uh, on revegetation uh, and management of the land. Uh, I think that in terms of the um, the progressive rehabilitation, I agree with Ray, a lot has been done there. There's still obviously a lot of work to do in terms of the final rehabilitation plans. And uh, we'll certainly be keen to see the licensees working, continuing to work closely with GLOAC to, to plan that. 
That's excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to pass the second one to, to Anna, uh, just to give a little bit of uh, information about how uh, uh, the uh, uh, use of cultural water, the thinking about water systems that have been in place over uh, over millennia, um, that have been uh, traditionally managed and managed well by the Gunai Kurnai. Can you give a little bit of a background to how these things uh, are uh, uh, developing um, uh, in terms of the thinking that it was, is within the LVRS and and within the wider uh, processes of uh, the the regional uh, river systems? Thanks, Ray. Um, and look, a really important important part of the LVRS and more broader water policy in Victoria as well. Um, the La Trobe Valley Regional Rehab Strategy does commit that no existing water users and traditional owner values will be worse off as a result of mine rehabilitation, and we are committed to adhering to this. So I did want to put that out, um, up front. Um, but yes, um, cultural values and the way traditional owners um, use and see the river systems is quite different to our Western views of accounting for the different water um, supplies and things like that. So in short, I guess it's really important that we listen and work with the traditional owners um, of the land. So related to this, um, the Gunai Kurnai Land and Water Corporation have recently received two gigalitres of unallocated water in the Mitchell River. Um, and this is the first time this has happened in Victoria's history. So we're currently um, will and continue to partner with the traditional owners through GLAWAC, so the Gunai Kurnai Land and Water Aboriginal um, Corporation to achieve their aspirations. Um, recently, the West Gippy CMA has completed an in updated environmental flow study and through this work they've partnered with GLAWAC to incorporate the Gunai Kurnai values in the La Trobe River. So this is a really important first step, um, but we do acknowledge that further work is required as this work progresses and as Anthony says, really encouraging the mine licensees to partner with the traditional owners in the work that they're doing on the mine lands themselves as well. Um, so, so yeah, plenty of work on, but still um, acknowledge that there is a long way to go as well. Thank you very much, Anna. I think uh, we should keep you live, and I'm going to talk over your picture. Or well, maybe I, maybe I'm not. I'm going to be present. Uh, so the first question that we have, which is a, a significant number of people liking it. Um, is uh, uh, from a gentleman called Nick. He says, this sounds uh, like uh, uh, confirming the use of alternative water sources is a long way off. Hazelwood wants to start filling this year. How is that going to work? Depending on how Anna answers this, I may add, add a few comments in myself, but over to you, Anna. <laughs> I look, you might need to add in some comments here, Ray, if you like, but I, I do understand Hazelwood um, Power Station has closed um, and that um, rehabilitation planning is very much underway um, through NG's work. Um, I understand that um, there has been a plan submitted um, and there's conversations with government going on, but um, so I can't really make comments here. Um, but probably best to speak to um, the horse's mouth with Earth Resources Regulation on this process. Um, but I guess what I can tell you is that NG, um, the operator of the Hazelwood Mine, is actively collaborating on assessing the feasibility of alternate water supplies. Um, they do see this as possibly in a long game. Um, but I can't talk from them, obviously, as well. Um, but NG has existing pathways to access water, including through their groundwater license to take and use that water. And they have historically used water from the Trobe River system as well. So any water from an alt water sources could supplement a water-based mine rehabilitation approach over that longer term. So that's, that's how I see that fitting in. Um, but over to you as well, Ray, to um, add to that answer if you like. Uh, that's a good answer, uh, Anna. I think it, it, it's very important. Um, obviously, there uh, uh, there is a possibility for using uh, water uh, within the, the Latrobe Valley uh, to as as a starting point for uh, putting water into the Hazelwood mine. 
Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that it will be available in the long term. And I think Anna's right to point out that the uh, uh, alternative water options could come into play later later in the filling if uh, it's agreed. And I think that's uh, that's that's an interesting uh, uh, process. So there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, work going on. And at the moment, uh, there is still um, uh, engagement between government and uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, mine operator uh, NG to actually work out uh, what the next steps will be. So, that, so that, that's an important uh, uh, element in this process. I think it's also important, and there is a question that comes further uh, along, uh, which is why is groundwater being ignored? Um, and of course, uh, I'm going to actually answer this one so we don't, uh, we, we can get it out of the way pretty straight forwardly. Because uh, we need to continue to uh, discharge groundwater to maintain stability of the mines, the groundwater can be used as part of the fill process. So it's such a natural component of the fill process that it, 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 it's almost strategically ignored because we know we, we because we know we need to 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 extract groundwater. We know that we can uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, or can expect to be able to use it as part of the uh, rehabilitation if uh, a, a lake option uh, is agreed and approved. So uh, we'll add that in. I've got another question for you, Anna. Um, in fact, I suspect there are a lot of questions for you, Anna. I do apologize. Uh, I think you got called out last time. Sorry for this. Um, the uh, uh, Would a pipeline from the Eastern Treatment Plant to the Latrobe Valley for mine filling be co-funded between mine operators and government? Uh, and you may not want to answer the second part. What would the question uh, cost be and what time frame for construction? I think probably that's something you're working on. Um, but uh, the, the first part is, uh, I know, is there an appetite for government to get involved in co-financing? So I guess, um Look, that's a bit of a tricky um, tricky question, um, and I guess from from my perspective, we are at the feasibility stage, so it is probably too early to say what funding arrangements may be. Um, I guess um, Anthony might want to speak to this more, but the MRSD Act does place responsibilities for mine rehabilitation of individual mine sites on mine licensees, including the planning and rehabilitation works and associated costs. So the feasibility work that we're looking at as part of these potential alternate water supplies is really focusing on taking that whole of community view so that the opportunities and impacts of different options can be compared more broadly. Um, I think the feasibility study itself doesn't really deal with this question, but it is a starting point. Um, the starting point, I guess, for the feasibility study is deliberately focused on what's, what's best for the community, both in the Latrobe Valley and more broadly, broadly, so that if any of those options um, are taken up, we can then work through who pays for what. It will, however, identify if there are broader benefits of alternate water supplies, so over and above just mine rehabilitation. So that's one of the key considerations that we'll need to take in on board when trying to answer this question of co-funding. So I haven't answered the question directly, but um, uh, I think taking that deliberate focus on what's best for the community in the first instance, um, when we're looking at these alternate water options, is a really good place to start. Oh, just on mute there, Ray. Again, thank you very much for that, Anna. Um, that was great. Um, uh, I, I'm going to skip what is the next question down because it, it had a very similar flavour to the one that uh, you, you've just answered uh, and I'm going to pass across to Anthony. Um, are you able at this stage to give any detail about whether non-water options are likely to be feasible, especially uh, in cost compared to expensive water solutions, how much dirt soil is needed uh, or is that all still to come? I, so I think the question is you know, gives you a, a free reign to answer that in, in an open way. Over to you, Anthony. Thanks for the question. I think the important thing is to have a really good factual information base um, so that 
we can collectively have informed conversations about it. Um, what we want to have uh, by June is a good start with that information base to understand really what is technically achievable, what isn't. Uh, what are the relative benefits of different uh, dry options, uh, different water supply options? Uh, what are the risks associated with all of those options in the long term? I think then um, it's it, we're in a far better position collectively to have a, uh, a good conversation about those things. Um, I don't want to sort of preempt things by jumping to um, to any um, assumptions just yet. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. Um, the next question that comes up is, uh, given what we know today about rehabilitation progress, what is the shortest lead time before we can see partial access available to the public for beneficial use? And I think I'm going to actually answer that a little bit myself first, and then I might see whether Anthony has any uh, follow up uh, uh, commentary in relation to that. Um, over the last two or three years, I've been thinking about that issue quite a lot. Um, and as you know, uh, in the early stages, the advocacy um, and the, the thought processes, particularly from the mine operators, was around the full, full pit lake option. Uh, and under those circumstances, even for our first mine, we were talking about um, probably 20 plus years before uh, we might be looking at relinquishment. And then the question would be, well, if you didn't put water in, could you actually um, rehabilitate the mine more quickly? And doing the analysis of the earthworks and the uh, various uh, uh, options that would have to be, uh, uh, activities that would have to be undertaken, you fairly rapidly get to roughly the same amount of time, uh, even for an empty pit to actually bring it to fruition. So we are realistically looking at a long time frame uh, for giving access. Now, the interesting thing there is that, of course, there's a lot of land on a mining lease that is not actually inside the mine. So the question would be whether or not some of those areas of land could be made accessible um, before we get to a final relinquishment of the entire mining lease. And that's an interesting question and a question which is actually being explored uh, at the present time uh, and one that I'm certainly personally very interested in because I think it it adds value to the community to be able to to get access to land earlier rather than later. I don't know, uh, Anthony, whether you want to add anything to that or whether you're uh, happy uh, uh, with me uh, stealing your thunder. <laughs> I'm happy with you stealing my thunder, uh, so nothing further to add, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. Um, OK, so the um, next uh, question um, uh, comes in and I'm just trying to uh, to get the uh, the sense of it, it says now that this modelling is completed and acknowledge that current values, cultural, current uses, etc., need to be maintained. How will future regional water land use policy develop? I.e., will rehabilitation take priority over other regional development requirements or opportunities? Now that's a really open question, um, and it probably needs a little bit of an answer from both of you if you're willing to do that. So I'm going to start with Anthony first, and then hand over to Anna um, uh, second. Anthony, have you got a, any thoughts around that? It's uh, an interesting question. I think the, the first thing is that the rehabilitation of these mines is a statutory obligation. It's a legal obligation and there's no skirting that. It's not like uh, the licensees can say, look, um, we um, are going to forego um, rehabilitation of these sites or do it in a um, limited way because there are other opportunities. It has to be done. Um, there are other um, legal obligations across the, the of course in other sectors um, as well so it's about um, different industries ensuring that they they meet those um, i think probably the core of the question is probably around where there is competition for uh, resources um, like water uh, or other materials 
So I think in terms of that, in terms of the, the water side of things, that's probably uh, what is best answered by Anna, if that's okay. Sorry to drop you in, Anna. That's fine, uh, happy for you to throw to me. Um, I think I'll just um, really point back to the core principles of the La Trobe Valley Regional Rehabilitation Strategy, um, which does, one of those principles in there is stating that traditional owner values and environmental values, as well as the rights of existing water users need to be protected for any water-based mine rehab option. So it's really clear there, there sorry, that those interests will be protected. That's one of the reasons why we are looking at alternate water sources and these non-water based options. So it's really critical that we do give these options a really thorough look at um, because we know water for mine rehab is likely to be limited moving forward um, because we do need to protect those interests of existing users, the environment and traditional owners. So I think um, that is fundamentally at the core of the LVRS. Um, and to put, I guess, put into context the LVRS, that's just one um, policy piece that government is working on. From a water policy piece perspective, we do have the Gippsland and, sorry, the Central and Gippsland Region Sustainable Water Strategy, which is kicking off at the moment, and we'll be engaging with community on that later this year. And that's where we can point to what are the priorities for water in the Gippsland region? How do we think it should be shared and where, what is the best use for that water? So I point you, I guess, to the sustainable water strategy process. It is a process where we do have robust conversations with stakeholders and the community. And it is a process where we do come up with um, a clear um, pathway for how water can be shared moving forward. So I, I don't think um, mine rehabilitation is going to take over that process. Um, as I said, it's pretty core in the centre of the LVRS that existing interests um, need to be protected. Um, and we've got the source process, which is happening in parallel. I also did want to just touch on the Southern Victoria Irrigation Development Program as well. That's the program that we are working, that Southern Rural Water are leading. Um, and that's the Rural Water Corporation who's responsible for um, down in the Gippsland region. And they are looking at the feasibility of expanding irrigation districts um, in that area. So when we're talking about regional development opportunities, that's one that is getting um, funded at the moment and it is in the development. And that, that um, piece of work will feed into the sustainable water strategy as well. So that we've got a, quite a good picture of what are the water needs moving forward in the La Trobe River system. Sorry, that was a long winded answer, um, but I hope um, that gives you some comfort um, in that space. And sorry. Lovely, thank you very much, uh, Anna. Um, I'm going to flip up the uh, uh, the question list a little bit. There is, there is an interesting question uh, uh, which is uh, uh, has been asked, which is said, why can't we fence off the dangerous areas, turn the pumps off and let nature take its course? Uh, and I'm going to take a snapshot at uh, um, letting people know what the answer to that is. Um, if you just switch the pumps off, uh, the aquifer pressures rise, um, the uh, uh, ground floor of the mine heaves, so it actually rises up, it destabilizes the edge of the mines uh, and will cause the edge of the mines to collapse. Now, if you were in the middle of nowhere and you didn't have any infrastructure like power stations and uh, roadways and houses, etc., around the edge, you might go, that might be worthwhile. It may be just a very convenient way to create a low, uh, a low level marshland uh, in, in a very broken up area that we wouldn't be using. But because we have roads that are running right next to the uh, uh, to the mines, because we have power line systems, because we have infrastructure, because we have houses, uh, all of these are significantly impacted the moment we allow destabilization to take place. So. As much as uh, you know, we would uh, uh, you know, 
be happy to do it if we were in a completely remote area and land issues were no problem and there weren't uh, people living locally. It simply isn't, uh, it isn't a possibility here. Uh, and just to put it in perspective, if we had to move the um, Princess Freeway, um, then we are talking billions of dollars to be able to do that. We, uh, uh, we are not in a position to, uh, uh, to trade off uh, allowing for uh, relaxation of our uh, rehabilitation requirements because uh, uh, the costs, if we uh, uh, want to be able to allow that to happen, become, uh, become uh, you know, massively uh, uh, unreasonable, uh, uh, both uh, socially, culturally and economically. So, uh, yeah, really interesting question. And I think it, you know, it's some, something one should always ask, but I think it is one where we're, uh, we're not in a position uh, to uh, to follow that uh, uh, route. Um, this one's for you, uh, uh, Anthony. Um, uh, it is, um, isn't it true that not enough soil exists to cover all the coal in the mines? So. Uh, thanks, thanks, Ray. Uh, it's about the depth of that cover. Um, if that cover was uh, of great depth, then that's a reasonable statement. Uh, if that cover were optimised so that only the uh, amount of soil that's absolutely needed uh, is used to cover coal in places, then uh, there probably is enough within the mine licence areas. That's our sort of preliminary feel for that. But that's an important part of the work that we're now doing. You know, what, are, what are the volumes that are needed to cover coal? What are the volumes that are needed to stabilise batters? Uh, what type of material is it? Uh, and what's the availability of that material within the, the mine licence areas? So yeah, good question. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Anthony. Um, next question is, um, I think probably better answered by Anna. Um, have you modelled on the basis of power station closures in advance of their current published closure dates? In other words, how likely we to we to be in a situation where we have uh, so many uh, um, uh, uh, mines closed and they're all looking for water? Uh, is it possible to consider that in in the work you're doing at the moment? Thanks, Ray, and really great, great question. Um, that's just one of the many uncertainties that we have with mine rehabilitation. Um, so I guess there's no short answer to, there's no easy answer to that one, um, except that it it is, um, I guess, in our consciousness um, that things might change. And we are continuing to work with mine operators to explore options that are compatible with their closure timeframes. So, um, they are important conversations to continue and we're pretty open with our information, particularly as they relate to these alternate water supplies that some water supplies might have a much longer lead time than others. So um, being really open with the mine licensees that um, that is the case. You just can't click your fingers and build a, a big new water supply to um, fill those mine voids if required. So yes, um, I guess our modelling does take into account a longer term horizon um, and the commitment is to provide, uh, be as proactive as possible in that planning space so that um, we are really aware of the closure timeframes, um, but also be really um, open and transparent about those lead times that might be required. Um, it is important that we get the solution right um, and we don't rush into it. Um, but, and I guess some options may have those shorter lead times, which might um, support um, those mines that might be closing earlier. So I guess talking to them about which options they would prefer us to um, investigate more fully in is definitely part of the plan and what we're currently doing. Um, the LVRS does put the onus on the mine operators to develop their closure plans, um, factoring in these parameters. Um, but yeah, we are working very consciously with them to um, make sure that everything is pretty above board and that we're really clear about these different opportunities and how they might relate 
to um, individual mine rehabilitation. And look, it is all about the information base and making the best decisions for those individual mines. Um, and collectively, I think we can do that. Thanks, Ray. Lovely, thanks very much, uh, Anna. Um, this is a follow-up question for you, uh, Anna, uh, and uh, uh, it, it also goes a little bit wider than that uh, uh, as well, uh, with, with, a, with two questions side by side that have a similar sort of flavour to them. Um, first uh, question is, will the government be investigating the possible flood mitigation and water storage benefits the mine voids could provide? Well, I'll ask that question first. and the, well, I actually asked the second part of the, the question, which is um, how much uh, are you going to be looking into secondary benefits, including availability of water for irrigators, recreation, community benefits, additional flows into the Gibson Lakes uh, and potential increases in property values, the ability to uh, provide water rapidly for bushfire responses in the local area, etc. So a big, big open question about the collateral benefits and, uh, and just benefits. Uh, so over to you, Anna. Yeah, look, I guess the short answer to that is yes, as part of the alternate water work, we are looking at those broader benefits for any alternate water supply. How much detail that goes into, um, is really a matter of how much time we have. Um, so we are doing it at that at a level um, that we think would support a decision about whether or not there are those border benefits or not. Um, so I'll touch on that in a little bit more detail, but the point that you made around the flood mitigation. So um, that is a point that we have had a fair bit of discussion with stakeholders on. And I guess it's um, definitely not off the table but I guess the potential impacts, both positive and negative, like with all um, options, um, need to be considered, including those that are related to the safety and stability of the mine void. And these will need to be further assessed. It's somewhat complicated, um, this answer, because for flood mitigation, so if you are using those voids for flood mitigation, you'd need to manage um, them to ensure there's enough airspace in them um, for that to occur. So making sure that um, my DJPR counterparts um, are really across those stability issues and sign off that there's no risks there. Um, and also making sure that that, that quick change in water level um, that would result from using it as for flood mitigation um, would need to be managed um, and making sure those structural integrity of the mine voids remain. Uh, I guess it's important to note as well that some high flows are important to the environmental values of the Latrobe River and the lower Latrobe wetlands. Um, so including, um, we've got the Sale Common, the Dowd Morass and the Hart Morass, which are all part of the Gippsland Lakes and those Ramsar sites. So the need for these high flows are um, outlined by the West Gippy CMA in their um, waterway management strategies and the state government flood management strategies. So I guess not all flooding is bad flooding. And so we need to be conscious that, uh, of that as well. So it's a bit of a complex one, definitely not off the table, but those risks do need to be explored more fully. I think the second part of the question was in relation to um, exploring the different opportunities and secondary benefits. And absolutely, that's definitely part of what we'll be looking at as part of exploring um, what alternate water could mean for the region. So looking at it from an agricultural perspective and feeding into that work that I was speaking about before, which is Southern Rural Water are leading through the Southern um, irrigation, Southern Victorian Irrigation Development Project. Um, sorry if I got that name wrong, Southern Rural Water. Um, but we need to understand um, what the value is, both for mine rehabilitation, but also more broadly. Um, so we are doing that piece of work, which I mentioned in the presentation today, um, to make sure that we understand those advantages and disadvantages of making the voids available as for some sort of community benefit. So looking at those amenity values, um, but also looking at the cultural values, the environmental values, opportunities for expanded agriculture, opportunities for growth, jobs growth and things like that. So make, working in with 
organisations like La Trobe Valley Authority, like La Trobe City Council, so that we've got a really clear picture on what those regional development needs are and how water could potentially enable jobs growth and economic prosperity in the region as well, because we know that's really important um, for La Trobe Valley and it's part of um, broader government policy as well. Super, good. thanks very much. Going to go slightly off piece now, but uh, since we've got the acting director core resources, uh, I thought I'd give him the opportunity to do a plug for the HESC project. What consideration has been given for mining coal for blue hydrogen in the future? Sure, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so the the work being done by the um, La Trobe Valley Regional Rehabilitation Strategy, as the name suggests, is regional in nature. It sets the regional context particularly with respect to things like water resources, uh, regional stability issues and so forth. So any new coal mining development in La Trobe Valley, should a proponent put that forward, uh, would need to put forward a rehabilitation plan uh, and have that plan approved uh, prior to that mining um, uh, commencing or, or being approved to commence. Uh, part of the governments and communities uh, consideration of that rehabilitation plan will be to consider it in light of uh, the regional issues set out in the strategy. So there's quite a, um, a formal process and a, 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 um, a logical process that involves uh, licensee putting forward a plan that's consistent with aligns with the, the LBRRS. Hope that's answered the question. Yep, thanks very much. I think, it, I think it probably is worth saying that because the hydrogen energy supply chain project uh, is underway at the moment, there is, a, there is a very strong appetite to actually develop hydrogen from coal. But the only way in which that, that, that would, could happen is if uh, carbon, can be, uh, carbon dioxide can be sequestered offshore. Um, but if it did happen, then uh, what, what Anthony is saying is absolutely right. Uh, expansion of mining in the area would have to have a properly uh, uh, processed uh, uh, form of rehabilitation locked in and the funding developed for it. So it, it's it's an interesting uh, area, but it is actually happening now. Okay. Um, so uh, an overarching question. I don't know, Anthony, how you feel about this one. Who would manage the long term and ongoing risks of a dry void option? I mean, I could give my answer, but I'll let you give your answer first, and then I'll I'll, I'll give my answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my response to that is that it's it. There's very clear obligations under the Act. So under the Act, uh, once the mining license is relinquished, that is rehabilitation has been completed, and the regulator has signed off that rehabilitation has been completed, then the ongoing post-closure or post-rehabilitation, maintenance, monitoring, etc., uh, is the responsibility of the landowner. Now, in this instance, uh, at, at the moment, the landowner is also the mining company in all three, in all three instances, all three mines. Uh, those mining companies can, of course, sell that land with all of the assets and liabilities that go with that. Uh, and the obligation to maintain uh, that post rehabilitated landform is uh, will be on the title that's um, now a, a formal part of the act so the title will have that obligation with it um, if another private uh, company or individual chooses to take that up that's then their responsibility uh, alternatively there is also a formal uh, avenue for the state to agree to um, become the landowner. Uh, and I'll let Ray answer that part because that's where the Mine Land Rehabilitation Authority comes in. Thank you for that, uh, Anthony. Yep, I mean, the, uh, the important part about the uh, implementation of the Mine Land Rehabilitation Authority was that it um, has the capacity to become the landowner. Uh, so landowner could be sold, land could be sold if it is uh, appropriate to do so into private ownership. Um, it would only be that way if it was capable of being managed by the owner. Um, but if it was not capable of being managed by a, uh, 
uh, a private owner, then we would be looking at uh, the Mine Land Rehabilitation Authority taking ownership of that land and, and actually managing it in perpetuity. And for the dry option, if we were not able to uh, switch off the pumps, if we were not able to uh, uh, stop the drainage of the batters, if we were not able to uh, uh, stabilize uh, uh, the batters against erosion, et cetera, et cetera, all of those costs would have to, uh, and actions would have to be covered by the landowner, and that is likely to be the MLRA. So the MLRA is a permanent institution deliberately put in place to allow us to take on the management of, uh, of those risks. Uh, we would clearly love those risks to be as low as possible. We would clearly love the uh, uh, activities that are undertaken by the MLRA to be as small as possible because uh, uh, that, that gives us the uh, most comfort that we will be able to work well on behalf of uh, people and we'll be able to give maximum access uh, to the community and the public uh, uh, to the land. So it is an interesting uh, uh, challenge. It's, uh, it's potentially a long way off uh, for the authority, but it is a really important part of the development of the authority in, into the future. Uh, uh, we, uh, we become the, uh, the landowner of last resort, which is, which is a fun place to be potentially. I probably won't be around to see it, but that's a shame, but that, that's a different matter. Um, there is a, uh, I, I'm going to bring this uh, to, uh, to a close uh, with one more question. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the question uh, I, I guess is um, uh, the following one. I'm just trying to pick one, uh, one, one nice one out. Um, it, the, the question I think comes through, it says, while the focus is on water, it is largely a social challenge of equitable allocation and use, which as Anna has described is a gnarly problem. How are social scientists involved in providing insights in what is actually a social challenge entwined with a biophysical research problem? So are you able to give a more the, the, the social perspective of the, uh, of the work that the LVRS is doing? Over to you, Anna. Thanks, Ray. Um, I've I probably um, am not going to finish on my highest note in terms of answering questions, so I really apologise for that because it is a fabulous question and you have hit the nail on the head. Um, border access and sharing is a social um, matter um, and through, I guess, the central, um, where I'm going to land this is through the Gippsland and Central Region Sustainable Water Strategy. It's really clear that um, that process is a process where we have robust cons consultation with the community. Um, those social elements are definitely one of those key pillars that have been considered as part of that broader water strategy um, and will definitely be front and centre of any of those considerations. So we are tick tacking very closely with um, the group who are developing that sustainable water strategy and we will continue to do so to make sure that any information that we develop as part of the LBRS is really aligned with what we're hearing from the community and from our stakeholders as part of that broader water sharing discussion, both in the Latrobe River system, but more broadly across the Central and Gippsland region. So I haven't answered that um, question directly, so I apologise for that because it is a really, really great question. You have hit the nail on the head um, to some degree, um, but I do assure you that social element and those social scientists will be involved in that broader SWUS process um, and it is a robust conversation that we'll be having with the community about water sharing um, across that region. Thanks, Ray. Um, Anthony, is there uh, anything you wanted to add to that or are you uh, happy that uh, uh, Anna has covered it off beautifully. That's a great response. I'm, ha I'm happy with that. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anna. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, there are some really good questions, some very curly questions in there. Uh, I think you've covered uh, uh, those off uh, extremely well. And I think uh, uh, 
you know, it shows the strength of the work that is being undertaken both on these two uh, uh, implementation actions, but all the implementation actions uh, that they're covering off uh, you know, substantial pieces of work and will deliver some interesting and important outcomes in due course. So it, it's beholden on me just to uh, thank everybody for attending and participating today. It's been uh, it's been great. Um, we will be putting up a recording uh, of the uh, event on our website. So if you want to go to mineland.gov.au uh, in a week or a couple of weeks time, then uh, uh, you'll be able to uh, pick it up if there are things that you want to just look back over and understand a bit more. Um, we will be sending out a, uh, um, a questionnaire. We would love to get feedback uh, from you uh, on the event uh, and also to invite you to uh, uh, suggest any other uh, topics that you would like uh, us to cover as we go forward. Uh, and we'll be delighted to try and do that. As you know, we try and do these sorts of things uh, every six months and, uh, and I anticipate that we will continue to use the webinar format as a very good way of actually uh, uh, communicating with the uh, with the wider community as well as uh, coming out to any uh, any groups who wish to actually uh, uh, speak to us or to hear and have a conversation around any matter related to uh, this. Um, any questions that we haven't answered tonight, we will uh, uh, look through those and, uh, and write written responses. So we'll try and capture all of the uh, questions that we haven't got. I think we got through uh, a very substantial number of them, so grateful uh, uh, that we were able to do that. Hopefully you've all gained some useful information today that's been, uh, been good. Uh, and uh, uh, just to say thank you and uh, goodbye from Anna, Anthony, myself and the whole team that has been uh, working uh, behind the scenes to uh, keep moving, uh, uh, moving the process along. So thank you and good night. <laughs>